<laughs> I have one more story. You know, have you seen the TV how dry it is in Texas? Well, it's caused a lot of consternation in the mainline denominations. The Baptists are starting to baptize by sprinkling. The Methodists are using wet wipes. The Presbyterians are giving out rain checks. And the Catholics, the Lutherans, and Episcopalians are praying for the wine to turn back to water. <laughs> Parker. <laughs> How do you top that? <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, you can go, you can go top Clemens. <laughs> you know, uh, Bob and I gave a speech to a group of executives down in Minneapolis yesterday, and it got a lot of hot. Oh, sir. Can't hear you. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's see, Bob. I'll hold it up like this. Yeah, put you know, it right up. Clemens told me that it was so hot during the Depression that the popcorn in the field popped, and the cows thought it was snow and froze to death. <laughs> <laughs> None of your smart talk, Vic. You know, I was going through this little magazine here about heroes and legends that they passed out at the week this weekend. Here's the mic. Bachman's in there, and uh, I noticed Lou Martin in there. He was handsome once. <laughs> then I began to read about what he did, and I wrote it down because I couldn't believe it. All the planes he's flown, all the countries he's visited, all the books he's written. When he was asked about the subject for today, he said it was about early, my early career in Germany and escape and evasion. And I noticed he locked the doors back there, so that must have something to do with escape and evasion. <laughs> Lou Martin, get on up here. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Hold it up here. Don't you <laughs> Back to my mouth, right? Yeah. Hey, I'm going to move this back a little bit in case I'll be an easy, easy target in case you want to throw something at me. <laughs> How about that? You know, I, I kind of... I think the reason that Vince and Dick invited me out today is because of the hot weather. They thought it'd be a good opportunity for everybody to take about a 30 minute nap. So, with that in mind, to help you out, I made a little sign that says, Sleeping is okay, <laughs> snoring is not. <laughs> so, what I'm going to talk about today, like Vince said, is some of my early excerpts from one of my books after I graduated from pilot training in 1949. I and several other second lieutenants were sent directly to Germany. Our first stop was Marburg. Marburg, Germany. It was up in the British zone. They used it as a, as a, re, a re -enlist, not a re-enlistment, but in a center for future transfers, for where you're going to be assigned. We spent about 10 days there, and it was in an old German base that was not bombed during the war. And one night in a gas house, I ran across a young man, I was 21 at the time, a young German, it turned out he was 20, 23 or 24, and he pointed to my wings and said, Sie werden American Kanisch Flieger, your American flyer. And I said, yeah, das ist richtig, so I speak just a little German. And through a broken German and broken English, it turned out that he was a Luftwaffe pilot. And he told me that he had checked out in the 190s just before the war ended, and he was never able to get in combat. He was commenting on my blue uniform. He said it was really snazzy. But I told him, I said, you know, I think the German Luftwaffe uniform was really neat, but I've never seen one in real. And he says, hey, us. he says, well, would you like to see one? And I said, yeah. He says, well, I have, I live in an apartment just around the corner with my widowed mother, whose father was killed in the Russian front. And he says, come on over and I'll show you my Luftwaffe uniform. So we left the gas house, went over there. He pulled his Luftwaffe uniform out of the closet. And he and I were about the same size. 
So I says, you know, I'd like to try on your German blue fog uniform. And he says, I'd like to try your Air Force uniform. So we changed clothes, and here I was in a Luftwaffe officer's uniform with the boots and the britches and the hat. See Kyle and he would, we were trying to teach other songs, drinking beer. And I said, you know, I'd like to have my colleagues see me in a Luftwaffe uniform. During this time, his mother was over there in Italy just watching these two crazy young guys. And we headed for the door and his mother said, nine, 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 maybe she plots here. No, don't go, leave here, stay here. So we sat down, we drank a few more beers, and I fell asleep on the sofa. In the middle of the night, I woke up, I had to go to the bathroom, and I woke up and looked at, down, I was in this German officer's uniform, it was like the twilight zone. I thought, what the hell is going on? I had to go to the bathroom, the next shock was the flyer was at buttons, not zippers. So we changed, I kicked it up, we changed clothes, and I often think, if I had walked down into that gas house in a German officer's uniform, and the MPs had picked me up, my career would have ended right there. No question about it. <laughs> Too sure. Uh -huh. a, a few days later, I was I and nine other second lieutenants were assigned to Rhine Main. The first thing that hit me, we were given four days off. And you guys did a hell of a job. These, these cities are just in ruins. This was four years after the war. Especially Mainz was about 85% destroyed. They had bulldozers that cleared the, the streets, but the cities themselves were in complete ruins. My first assignment was as a C-54 co-pilot. Now the Berlin airlift had ended in September officially. I arrived there in October. So we're still flying, they're still flying missions up to Berlin, but not the frequency of the Berlin Airlift, which they had an airplane that landed every two minutes or 720 a month. And I was assigned, most of our aircraft commanders were World War II vets, B-17s, B-24 guys. Some of them were really characters. They were recalled for the Berlin Airlift. A few of them put on so much weight, they couldn't butt their plows, but nobody cared. We had to be in uniform at all at that time. Because of the occupation, they just walk around with their blouse open. One pilot that I flew with, he had a big German shepherd called Brunus. Everywhere he went, that dog went. To his apartment, to the officer's club, even in the airplane. When we fly up to Berlin, the airplane would usually be loaded, but coming back would be empty. And he'd sit there in the left seat, throwing a tennis ball in the back of the airplane, and Brunus would run back, Fetch that tennis ball, come back up, saliva running out of his mouth, farting, <laughs> and he'd grab the tennis ball, he'd throw it back, and Brutus would do this back and forth for about an hour. One day we landed at Rhine Main, and as we were taxiing in, he looked over, and our marshaler was a German fellow that he knew, and he said, I know that guy. He just loves Brutus. He says, turning to me, he says, continue taxiing the airplane. He jumped out of the seat. And he said, Brutus, here. Brutus jumped up in the pilot seat. He put a headset on him. <laughs> and as we approached, we were about 20 feet from the ramp. And here's this German marshaler marshaling the airplane in. The captain stood the window back. And Brutus sticks his head out with the headset out and starts barking. <laughs> I thought that German marshal was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> uh, it's right after the war. We never get away with that now, but cities, like I mentioned, were all bombed out, but the housing areas were completely intact, and the army would go through blocks and blocks and blocks and tell the Germans to move out, making room for the American servicemen and their families for housing. Now get this, as a second lieutenant, I was provided with a one-bedroom apartment, completely furnished, everything, including china, crystal, pots and pans, all I needed to move into that was a toothbrush and a comb, which I needed both because I had more teeth and more hair than I do now. And the apartment came with a full-time maid, a gardener, and someone, excuse me, someone come around and stole the furnace. This was part of the Marshall Plan. It wasn't to placate the cap or Lieutenant Martin. It was employment for these people. But I had a full-time maid as a second lieutenant bachelor. They, in those days, everything was still rationed. 
cigarettes, coffee, sugar, candy bars, and we could get the attention of a young German Fraulein for a pack of cigarettes, which cost us 10 cents. Can you imagine that? What a deal. <laughs> Again, after I moved off base, I needed transportation, so I bought a 1941 Chevy Coupe from a fellow that was rotating back to the States. I took out a loan in the credit union, and I bought this nice green 1941 Chevy Coupe. One night, I had, uh, one night on a Friday night, I had left a party over the nurses, nurses' quarters, and I was swinging by the officer's club to, to see if I could pick up a couple of my buddies so we could head downtown and utilize some of our cigarettes. It was 10.30 at night, and I drove up and down the parking lot. Every spot was taken except one, General Strickland. <laughs> And I looked at that spot and I said, hell, it's 10.30 at night. Let me give you a little background on General Strickland. He was born in 1895. He was commissioned in 1917. Served and fought in the Aragon Forest fight in World War I. Went through pilot training from 1921-22. Served in pursuit squadrons in the 20s and 30s. Fought during the North African campaign up through Sicily and Italy. He was a perfect, he could step right out from here to eternity with Burt Lancaster and Frank Sinatra. He was of the old school. And I thought, 10.30 at night, hell, he's an old guy at 55. He's probably back home with a glass of warm milk ready to go to bed. So I could pull into his spot for just a few minutes while I go to the club to see if I can pick up a couple of my buddies. I pulled into General Strickland's spot, and I was at the bar having a drink. Somebody came up to me and he said, Lou, don't you have a green chili coop? And I said, yeah. He said, well, they're towing it away out in front of the club. And I went out there. There was a small group of bystanders. General Strickland giving orders to the marshal, the marshal officer, provost marshal. And he said, I was stood there with the other people watching told him to pull this car up. General Strickland was talking to the provost marshal. He says, I want the name of that officer who parked in my spot. I want him in my office at 8 o'clock Monday morning. And that car goes in the pounding lot and won't be released until I authorize it. And there goes my car. <laughs> so I said, this, this provost marshal, he is a New York cop, recalled to active duty during the Berlin airlift. A nice guy, there by himself. He seemed to like to associate with the younger officers. I played pool with him a lot. I walked walk back in the officer's club, up to the bar, and I turned to him and I said, Major, can I buy you a drink? He says, yeah, he done it, he says, go ahead. So I bought him a drink, I said, I said it looks like he just been, had some activity. He said, yeah, some, some stupid SOP parked in General Strickland's spot, and I have to find out who that driver is and tell him to report to General 8 o'clock Monday morning. I said, well, I can save you a little time. I said, that stupid SOP was me. And he said, Jesus, Martin, how could you be so damn stupid? And I said, well, it just comes natural. <laughs> and I said, but the problem is, I don't have a car for the weekend. I said, can you give me an authorization to release that car for the impounding lot? He said, oh, Jesus, I don't think I can do that. I said, have another drink. <laughs> and I said, nobody will know. And I won't tell anybody. I used to walk, why not? Why not? What the hell? He says, I don't like the general anyway. <laughs> so he grabbed a piece of paper and authorized me to pull, get my car. I went down to the impounding lot with a buddy. They were just getting ready to close the gate. I gave it to the sergeant and I drove away with my car. Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I parked in the parking lot in front of Wing Headquarters. About 10 minutes to 8, I walked into the secretary office of General Strickland and said, I'm Lieutenant Martin and I'm here to report to the general. She said, are you the one that parked in this spot? And I said, yes, ma'am. Eight o'clock, right on the dot. I went into General Strickland's office behind this big oak desk, and I reported to Second Lieutenant Martin, reporting as ordered, sir. He got up from his desk, came around to see that I had shine shoes, a press uniform, clean haircut, and he went back and sat down, and he said, Lieutenant Martin, what squadron are you in? I says, the 12th squadron, sir. He says, do you have a private parking spot in the 12th squadron? 
And I says, no, sir, I'm the second lieutenant. He says, well, if you had a private parking spot with 12 squad, do you think I'd park at him? And I says, no, sir. You would. He says, that's right, then why the hell would a second lieutenant park in a general officer's spot? He said, lieutenant, he says, someday do you hope to make first lieutenant? And I said, yes, sir. He says, you park in my spot again. And he says, you'll never see first lieutenant. You may not even be in the Air Force. He took a piece of paper and he says, now you can go down to the impounding lot and get your car. He didn't know it was out the front. <laughs> <laughs> There's another general that you may know, General Cannon. Remember the name General Cannon? Three-star general. He was the Air Force commander in Germany. Another vintage going back to the 1890s and World War I and all through the 20s. He had a very attractive daughter called Molly, 19 years old. I never dated her, but we were on a first name basis. She was always in our young officers' parties with the nurses and the second lieutenants. And she was just really kind of a nice gal. One Saturday afternoon, we were having a party at the officers' club. And I was working to open a bottle of champagne with my thumb, and it was just about ready to pop. It was one of those bottles of champagne many years ago with a hard metal cork top. About that time, Molly came over, leaned over my shoulder, and she says, what are you doing, Lou? The champagne cork popped and hit her right in the nose. <laughs> my God, poor old Molly, the blood starts squirting out on my uniform, and she was, of course, crying in shock. We laid her down on the floor. I took out a clean handkerchief, it was full of blood, and with it, putting it over her nose. Somebody got a first aid kit, we put some cotton in each nostril, and, finally, and I was apologizing, and Molly put a sport. She says, not your fault, Lou. She says, but will you take me home? Will you drive me home? And I thought, yeah, sure. So I put her, I took her out to my car, drove her to the officers, general officer's quarters, and her mother came out. She had blood in her front, and she says, you been in an accident? Good Molly says, no, I was hit with a champagne cork, and it's not Lieutenant Martin's fault. And she says, what's your name? And I said, Lieutenant Martin. She says, I'll tell the general that you brought my daughter, our daughter home. <coughs> During that period of time, it was such a wonderful time in Germany, they had millions of rounds of ammunition left over from World War II. An officer could check out submachine guns, Brownie submachine guns and a grease gun. We'd check out cases of ammo, go out to the rifle range and throw a can of ammo can out and see who could bounce it out the furthest to the full round until the range was so full of smoke we'd have to stop shooting. There was another time that I thought I'd never make first lieutenant. I had a flight to Molesworth, England. You fly up there, and this was in the early 50s. I don't know how you guys found your base there. Airports all over the place. Molesworth was still open, Scalthorpe, and Lincoln Heath. And I flew up to Molesworth to spend the night, and that night it rained like hell. Boy, did it rain. The next morning, I was getting ready to leave, just getting ready to start the engines, and a jeep came out, and he said, hold up, Lieutenant. He says, there's the Colonel, full Colonel from London, that needs a ride to Rhine, Maine for an important meeting. He wants a ride with you. So we waited. About 45 minutes later, this colonel came out. We put him in the navigator's seat. And I mentioned it rained like hell the night before. I was parked in the spot where I'd have to make a sharp left turn. No nose will steer him. As I made this sharp left turn, right throttle, I heard the gushing of water. I looked back and water was pouring out of the, the insulation, dumping out this colonel's head. His coal over here was straight down. He was completely wet. And I looked and I said, geez, I, put, I slammed on the brakes. When I slammed on the brakes, another gust of water kept hitting him in the back of the head. He said, God damn it, Lieutenant. He says, geez, I have to go to a meeting. I said, do you want to get out, Colonel? He says, no, get this thing airborne and turn up the heat. So when we dropped him off at Ryan Maid, he marked down my name. And he, when he left the airplane, it looked like he was in, in a set of blue pajamas with ribbons. He <laughs> <laughs> was a hell of a mess. My second, in spite of all that, I did make first lieutenant. <laughs> and 
and I transferred back to the States in 52, and in 54, I had an opportunity to go back to Germany, which I volunteered for. It looked like a really nice assignment. This is where the E&E &E comes in. It's, we were to pick up brand new C-119Gs at Hagerstown, Maryland, and fly them to Germany. We are going to be based in Neubiburg, Germany, a base just south of Muni, and actually on the outskirts of Muni. It had been a German 109-190 base during the war. Now this was in the mid-50s. We had 54 C brand new C-119s there. I remember I became quite friendly with a German bartender named Gunther. He had been a bartender on the, one of the German officers, and one day I was asking Gunther, I said, Gunther, what's the difference between serving drinks to American officers and German officers? He says, none, they're all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but again, this was in the mid-50s. The Cold War was really growing leaps and bounds. As you know, the Soviet Union had taken over, of course, East Germany and, and Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and of course, Russia itself. Our, our mission was classified in one respect, in another case, it was secret. We did an awful lot of night formation, and Mel would relate to this. We knew that our mission, in case the bell rang, they expected the, the Russians to come down to the Fulda Corridor, down through Frankfurt. Our mission would be dropping troops at night somewhere behind the Iron Curtain. We practiced night formation, but night after night. One mission that I qualified for, and in spite, I stopped barking in general spots, I made captain. And one mission that I qualified for, it was a night mission. I want you to get this. We took off at night, maybe one or two o'clock in the morning, no lights on the aircraft, on a securious route to some on undisclosed landing zone, 500 feet over the open country, on radar altimeter, no lights. We hit a prominent IP initial point. From there on, we took a heading, and as we got about four miles from the area where we're still, no lights. We dropped flaps here and sat up 120 knots, two miles per minute. And as we approached some field in the distance, we'd see a flashing light with a code like make Foxtrot X ray. Dit da da, dit da, dit dit da, dit dit da. If we'd aim for that light, no lights, 250 feet a minute, and when we'd touch down, full reverse, and it's get brakes. We had the clamshell doors off in the back. We turned on the green light as soon as we stopped. Some people would jump out, others would jump on. It was designed to we supply the underground in the event the bell rang. It'd take about 30 seconds to offload and load. When I'd start running the engines up, on the far end of the field would be another flashing light. We'd go full power, water injection, and make a short field takeoff. No lights at all. It was surprising that the landing wasn't too bad on that sod field. But it was one of those, I did that three times. Every six months I had to show, and that was a top secret mission. And then for some reason it was canceled, but it was really interesting. It was one of those missions you like to talk about it at the bar afterwards, but during, when you're flying it, it's not too exciting. Since we were considered combat crews, we had learned, when I say we, collectively, the Air Force and the Army, we had learned an awful lot about how our prisoners of war were conducted. As we know, back in World War I, it wasn't too bad. World War II, in some cases, in Germany it was bad, but in Japan it was terrible. And a lot of prisoners were executed and tortured. And then, of course, in Korea and North, North Korean prisoners, we had about 7,000 prisoners in North Korea. 2,700 of them died in captivity, and some of them are still unidentified. So they set up, Spook and I were talking about it. Spook, wake up, Spook. He read my sign. Where's my sign? Spook and I are talking about E and E. 
before. So they had designed a course, Escape and Evasion, and to train us in what to expect in case we were captured. Now, different than what Spook was trained for, he was trained for Escape and Evasion in the Orient. Now, there's no, no matter what we do, we can't look like an Oriental. But in Germany, it was all Caucasians, so we had that advantage. Our escape and invasion was set up because in case we were behind enemy lines, it would be in Europe. The, the course that we were briefed on, it, it coincided with an army exercise between the Red and the Blue Army, American Army. They said that the army troops were told every Air Force crew member that they captured, it would be a three-day pass for one or two. They said, you don't want to be captured by the American Army because they'll take your boots, they'll tie you up, probably blindfold you, and they'll turn you over to special forces. In our case, in my case, I had a blue armband, and my co-pilot and I were dropped off, they dropped us off two by two in a six-by truck, somewhere out in a boat in a country road. We had no idea where we were. The curtains were drawn in the middle of the night. You just jump out. It was so simulated that you bailed out. I had a blue armband. I was behind the Red Army lines about 50 miles. And we were to make our way to our Blue Army line and escape the Red Army line. They told us that the Special Forces had been trained on this. Some of them were dressed in Russian uniforms, spoke Russian. They went so far as they briefed some German civilians that if you can turn over, turn in an Air Force escapee, you'll be rewarded. They had other Germans that would assist us. And then they dropped us off in the middle of the night. We had a map. The only thing we were allowed in our flight suit was a couple bullion cubes. They held its own tablets for water, a canteen, and a map and a compass. We dropped off in the middle of the night. First thing we had to find out is where were we? Now they told us they didn't want us to take livestock from the Russian, I mean from the Germans, but we might be able to find a few potatoes and, and apples and so on. So they said there'd be there was a free zone about 40 miles away. It'd be a four-hour free zone, and when we arrived at that point, there'd be a chicken dinner. Oh yeah, oh geez, that sounds really great. So we traveled that night, hold up the daytime. We finally, through triangulation and taking point, knowing points in the compass, we got to this free zone. We looked over it. When 12 o'clock, we went down there. We were expecting a chicken dinner. The truck drove up with a crate of live chickens. <laughs> and for each two, they had us a big live chicken. My co-pilot says, we are hungry. We hadn't eaten for four days. My co-pilot says, what the hell are we going to do with a live chicken? I told him, I says, well, I kind of grew up on a farm. I said, I'll show you what I'm going to do. I took that chicken, spun him around, and snapped. And snapped his head off. Then we dry plucked him. We had chicken lice around our rice band. He was complaining about that. And I said, oh, the chicken lice, as soon as they find out you're not a chicken, they'll eat. Which is true. And we, and we sliced off small pieces of the breast and then on a stick, we barbecued him right away on the fire because we only had four hours of free time. There were some of these guys, they were still trying to cut off a chicken head with a jackknife. Some of these chickens were running around with the head half cut off. Others had made pets on them with a parachute, parachute lanyard. And only about half of them took advantage of that. When the free time was up, we had eaten little pieces of chicken and we cut other small pieces up and put them in parachute silk and we had to head out again. Traveling that night, the realism was unbelievable. We were walking down a night road and we ran across a Red Army patrol and they told us, halt, halt. And we ran into the woods, but behind us we could hear submachine guns shooting at us. You knew there were blanks, but you could see the flashes and you could hear the sound and we didn't want to be captured by the army and turned in. One of the advantages, if you can escape and get back to your lines, as a reward, you, we would be able to watch them interrogate other captured prisoners. 
the about after we left the free zone, it was about the third night, and we were my co-pilot and I were hiding in some bushes overlooking a small village. We got to figure out what we could steal from those villages when it got good and dark. And I saw this man walking down the road, just like intelligence had told us. He was walking down the road with a newspaper under his left arm and whistling Lily, Lily Meyer Lane. Da, 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 da. That was a code that they told us that he'd be a good contact. But you couldn't be sure of, any, sure of anything. Another code, if you, if you crack, crack up a discussion with the individual, everything would have to end up in 10. So I told my buddy, I said, you wait here, I'm gonna go down and see if I can see if this guy's a contact. So I went down and I said, good talk. He says, good talk, good evening. I says, how many cigarettes? Do you have cigarettes? He says, yeah, I shall. I have cigarettes. I says, how many do you have? He says, yes, I have in English. He says, I have 10 cigarettes. How many do you want? I says, 10 is fine. I said, you have sisters and brothers. You have sisters and brothers. He says, yeah. I have five sisters and five brothers. One see, and me. I says, yeah, I have seven brothers and three sisters. So we went back and forth. Everything came out to 10. So he was a contact. And then he asked me in broken German and English, are you alone? I said, no, my comrade is up there. I pointed out where we're hiding in bushes. And he says, go back there. Go, and I come so I come back in Thrancy Manoot. So I went back to my buddy. But again, they briefed us, you can't be sure. Spook knows this. He may still not be a good contact. So when we went back, we went off about 60, 70 feet to see if he was coming back alone or coming back with armed police. About 45 minutes later, he came back by himself. He was looking around the bushes, didn't see us, I waited for a little bit, and I said, over here. So we went down there, and he said, come with me. So we went, we went down the village, and we came to a barn, and he said, pointed, he says, get up in the barn. So we went to the second floor of this barn, it was over a pigsty. We'd hear the pigs grunting underneath, smelly as hell, but he, it was hay up there, so he, put, he said, I would say, hunger, are you hungry? Yeah, I shall feel hungry, I'm very hungry. He says, wait. So we put us over the barn, the pigs grunting underneath, smelly like hell. He came back about 30 minutes later with some salami, bread, and a bottle of wine, and a pot that we could use with the train. And boy, that really felt good. We covered up with, hit, with straw, and early in the morning, about sunrise, I heard the rumblings of a tank, and trucks, and voices. We were a Blue Army band. I looked through the cracks of this second floor. There was Red Army troops that decided to sit around our, uh, our barn. They were having breakfast completely around the barn. By God, if they had capped it, it would be a three-day pass for these people and then they turned us over to, to the special forces. So we were quiet as hell about noon, they disappeared. Around sunset, our contact came back, and he said, go, 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 go. So he put us in the back of an old jalopy, gave us a workman jacket and a farmer's hat. We had to shave for about a week or more. And we drove to the edge of this town, and he says, Hubschauber, Hubschauber, German is helicopter. He says, Hubschauber, come. Helicopter come in 30 minutes. He dropped us off on this edge of this field. About 30 minutes later, we heard the whoop, 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 whoop of the helicopter. The helicopter hovered, dropped a sling, lifted us up in the helicopter, took us back to free area. Now, as they promised, if we had escaped, we were able to observe them interrogating some of our captured colleagues. They threw a one-way mirror. We cleaned up a little bit and threw this one-way mirror, which we could hear. There was three Special Forces troops dressed in Russian uniforms, speaking, they were Americans, but speaking back and forth in Russian and English. And they brought in this captain, Spook would relate to this, they brought in this captain. He was still in his flight suit, but he obviously had been deprived of sleep deprivation 
and he's hungry, and he was staggering. He's tied up at the ankles, wrist, and his head down behind him. And they sat him down, and they start parading him with questions. What, your, what organization are you from? What have you been flying, and so on. Barking in his ear. They weren't allowed to strike, but everything else. And finally, they said, what do you want? He says, I want water. He says, I, one of these special forces guys, I'll give you water. He took a glass of water and threw it in his face. And he, I could see him licking his lips, that's the only water he had. This went on for quite some time. The next individual that was brought in, as it turned out, was Lieutenant Colonel. He was stark naked except for a hood over his head. He was also trussed at the ankles and his arms behind him and kind of struggling. And he's shivering. Obviously, he had been in a cold cell for maybe a couple of days, isolated. This is a training, American training. And they led him over and sat him down in a cold steel stool, pulled the hood off his head. And he was blinking from the bright light, and they start questioning him, saying what a, he was a war criminal. He could be executed, asking for his organization. And all he could say, name, rank, and serial number. They start criticizing him for being in the position. They even criticized the size of his penis and said, how can you be a man with a penis that small? You know back at your base, your colleagues are screwing your wife. He broke down in tears with all this. Of course, he'd been in a cold cell, isolated cell for probably two or three days. And he just couldn't take it anymore. This was training. And like we know in later years, our politicians say this is cruel in the human treatment. Spook went through some of the same stuff, but in a different part of the world. So I wanted to mention this just to put things in proper perspective. And I've got 35 minutes, Vince. So I got my stopwatch here. So now with any questions about anything, I'd be glad to either answer them or duck them. Just Ooh. Yeah. With these great stories and your experiences from Wings Over Persia, are we going to get a movie out of some of this stuff? <laughs> That's an interesting. Thanks, Dick. Monday, two days ago, I had an interesting phone call. What was his name? I think it was it was uh, Max Daly. He said, "I'm Max Daly." I said, "Yeah." This is two days ago. I said, "Who are you with?" He says, "Metro Golden Bear Studios in Hollywood." I says, really? He says, yeah. He says, we're getting ready to make a movie about Iran. And I pulled up your book, Wings Over Persia, on the computer. And I'd like to ask you some questions. And I said, sure. And then he said, I'll send you some pictures I'd like to have you comment on. And he said, the movie is going to be directed by Ben Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. And he says, your book sounds so interesting. He said, could you send me a copy of this book overnight? And I said, so. Monday night, I sent him a copy of the book by Frederick Express overnight. I got an email from him this morning. He said, I received your book. And he says, I'm starting reading it. And after I read your book, he says, I'll probably have more questions. I don't know if it'll go beyond just reading my book, but it's kind of interesting that Bethlehem Golden Bear is interested in my book. He said, I was thinking of ordering one from Amazon.com, but I said, oh, you don't want to do that because Amazon.com has old books. The one I have is updated in 2009, so I'll keep you posted whether I have to go to Hollywood or not, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, is the account that you've just given us in one of your books? The, it, it is. Some of the anecdotes or the, of my early carefree life is in the book, but more interesting humor that in the book. And wings over, I mean, Close Encounters of the Pilot Scrim Reaper is in there. And of course, I think my contact with Metro Golden Mare is not in there. That just happened. Uh, there it is. Yeah, all, all the stuff is in the. Close Encounters of the Pilot Square Reaper and the first part. And a few of you people have had the good fortune of buying it and reading it, and I compliment you, you on your good taste in literary art. <laughs> <laughs> but any other questions? 